want to taste it? <laughs> this is extremely Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. The college consists of the following format. We first have a brief announcements period. Then we have the, our speaker who will speak. Then we have a question period where you're encouraged to ask questions and not make speeches at that time because after the question period, you'll each have your chance to spout off in our infamous rebuttal period. There are two rules that the college has. One is, and I'm sure most of you know about this, no personal attacks. Uh, Boo. <laughs> and the second is one, one fool at a time. Yeah, we got a great uh, Shut up, fool. Uh, All right, tonight we're going to be having Michael Burick, who states that cannabis has been around for 3,000 years and is should be going mainstream for medicinal reasons. Some current obstacles are big pharma lobbyists, poor information about cannabis and its proven health benefits, and antiquated, antiquated federal regulations that will, sub, that will be supplanted by states that need the tax revenues. Let's welcome to the podium, Mr. Michael Burick. I can smell it in the back already. <laughs> I passed out earlier a uh, questionnaire. Uh, does everybody, did everybody get one? Okay, so what I'm trying to do is, uh, I have a prize for the winner here. Um, I'm trying to see when you think cannabis was first noticed. So I got one from somebody at this table, said 1850, not right. Yes? Egypt. Do you have a date? Oh. Um, the pharaohs. The pharaohs. Give it a PC. Oh, I, got I need. I need years. Oh. I need years because I can. I, I, I can. Two hundred BC. How much? Two hundred BC. No. Jesus and the Apollo. Okay. Anybody else want to make a guess? 1000 BC. 1000 BC. Okay. Anybody else? That's Corinna. 2000 BC. 2000 BC. Okay. Anybody else? 3000 BC. Is that a legitimate uh, point? Okay. Anybody want to take another guess? Okay. 3000 BC is actually 100 years off. Okay, it was 2,900 B.C. So come on up, I got a present for you, a prize. Where's the winner? Come on up. What do I win? Okay, here you go. It's a weed hat. Oh, okay. oh, you got to put it on and show everybody. Come on. I don't know if it's your size, but uh, I think that they're now adjustable. All right, put it on and show everybody what you just want. Thank you very much. Hey. Yeah, genuine, uh, a genuine weed hat, so uh, we know your preferences. It was a good guess. It was 2900 BC. Uh, a couple of things before we get into the presentation. I want to thank uh, Tim for um, helping me with the presentation. Uh, I have, uh, I'm sorry? Sorry. I have 70 pages of dates that are significant in the history of cannabis, and we're not going to go through all of them. Um, and I want to thank uh, Corinna, who introduced me back to the College of Complexes. Uh, the last time I spoke at the College of Complexes, it was in a little dingy place around the corner from the Newberry Library. And my adolescent friends and I had fake IDs, and we got in there. And my presentation, 
interestingly, was promoting changing the drinking age from 21 to 18. Uh -huh. So you can see I'm still in the same fields, marijuana and alcohol. However, marijuana and alcohol are very different. Thank you. So how are we doing, Tim? You no? Know? It's, it's working. i got to replace a cable. All right. Well, Just start up, start up. The uh, reason I'm, I'm speaking about cannabis is because I started a company recently that is raising money for people going into the cannabis business. Uh, we prefer, and I think that uh, at this particular juncture in time, the world prefers that medicinal be the drug of choice. And I'm going to give you some reasons for that uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm about done with my introduction, so... I'll have it ready in a second, don't worry. Just keep okay, talking. Tim says we'll be ready in a second. Uh, Wait a minute, and Wait for, it, for me to give you the thumbs up, okay? You know, I have the text someplace, but it's... It's there on, on there, right there in your chair. All right. Okay, so we'll let Tim catch up, and I'll... Uh, I'll just have to, you know, read it. Uh, you want to get by? Okay, so bear with me because I didn't memorize, you know, the 70 pages of text. In 2900 BC, the Emperor Fu Xi, whom the Chinese credit with bringing civilization to China, seems to have made reference to ma, M-A, a Chinese word for cannabis, noting that cannabis was very popular as a medicine because it possessed both yin and yang. We all know what that is. No, oh, what is it? Good and bad. Okay, I'm going to jump to 1450 BC, where the book of Exodus references holy anointing oil made from cannabis as described in the original Hebrew version of the recipe in Exodus 30 colon 22-3 contained over six pounds of canna bosom, a substance identified by respected etymologists, linguists, anthropologists, botanists, and other researchers as cannabis. So the book of Exodus actually talks about cannabis. Now we'll go down to 1213 BC, which is a couple hundred years later. No, Egyptians <laughs> used cannabis <laughs> for glaucoma, inflammation, and enemas. Where are you at? Next, next one is uh, okay here. The next one is uh, 30. Okay, we're getting our stuff together here. I think she's uh, Wait, what do I do? Didn't that just been done in advance? I don't know. This is just advances. This way. I want to go and go back is this way. No, I want to go forward. All right, forwards this way. Okay. Back is that way. Okay. So there you go. Where are I at now? I can't see that. 1450 BC. I want to go to 30, 830. Let's scroll forward. Check that out. 1,000. I'll write things down. Just keep going. I'll get you. I'll get you. There. Okay. Here's one that's going to throw you for a loop. In 30 BC or 30 AD, in the Bible's New Testament, Jesus anointed his disciples with a potent ethnogenic psychoactive substance oil sending out the 12 apostles to do the same. So, did Jesus use cannabis? Got one more, this advance. One more. Yes, I did actually, before I got here. 
No, I'm just kidding. Or no. I. You want to back it up a little bit. I need to get to 30 and then forward. I'm sorry about all this. They're right. Which 30? No. Okay. Your notes. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes it didn't. Uh, so the question that I raised is, did Jesus use cannabis? And the uh, author of this particular note says, I think so. The word Christ does mean the anointed one. And a guy named Bennett, Chris Bennett, says that Christ was anointed with chrism, C-H-R-I-S-M, a cannabis-based oil that caused his spiritual visions. The ancient recipe for this oil, which I talked about, that was reported in Exodus, included over nine pounds of flowering canvas tops extracted into a pin, which is about 11 pints of olive oil, and a variety of other herbs and spices. The mixture was used in anointing and fumigations that significantly allowed the priests and prophets to see and speak with Yahweh. We know what Yahweh is. Okay, I, each one of these has a source so that source is a guy named Chris Bennett. Was Jesus a stoner, which I would not ordinarily use as a term. And it was published in a magazine called High Times Magazine in 2003. High Times is one of the oldest magazines that's been reporting on cannabis uh, since it sort of got into our consciousness. Okay, in 79, I can't see what that says. Does it say 79? Roman seventy. Okay. In 79, Pliny, the elder, yeah. writes about medicinal properties of cannabis plant, of a cannabis plant. Pliny the elder, an ancient Roman nobleman with histor and historian, and wrote, who wrote a book called Naturalis Historia, The Roots of the Cannabis Plant, Boiled in Water, Ease Cramped Joints, Gout, and Similar violent pain. There's also a reference for that. <clears throat> I want to go to 1500. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Muslim doctors, very interesting because we don't give enough credit to the Muslim, to Muslim history. It was quite a civilization that did a lot of remarkable things in spite of what we know about what's going on today that was a, really a, a, a fine, magnificent, scientific, educational, uh, and uh, literate, literate society. After the 1500s, once Islam spread to India, Muslim doctors used the Persian theories to guide their use of cannabis. Their applications tended to stress the late effects rather than the early ones. So they used it, for example, as a means of reducing sexuality rather than increasing it. Okay, let's go to 1578. Next one. 1538, Hemp in the Middle East. 1578, right? Yeah. Okay, Chinese medical text describes medical uses for marijuana. A Chinese medical text describes the use of marijuana to treat vomiting, parasitic infections, and hemorrhaging. Marijuana continues to be used in China as a folk remedy today for diarrhea and dysentery and to stimulate appetite. Okay, moving along. That's William Shakespeare, 1600. 1611 I want to go to. The next one then. Okay, the Jamestown settlers actually brought some marijuana with them, marijuana with them to the uh, Jamestown colony. They brought the plant promptly, at that time it was called hemp, to North America in 1611 and throughout the colonial period. Hemp fiber was an important export. Indeed, in 1762, Virginia awarded bounties for hemp culture and manufacture and impose penalties on those who did not produce it. In 1621, Robert Burton suggests cannabis as a treatment for depression in his influential and still popular 1621 book, The Anatomy of Melancholy. <laughs> In 
in 1745, George Washington was growing hemp. Say no more. In 1774, Thomas Jefferson was growing hemp at Monticello. In 1840, What happened? You, you, uh, nothing happened. You just hit the wrong button again, that's all. No, no I just, I've been doing the right one for a few years. I want to go to 1840, please. Okay, I'll just keep going. I don't want to keep you here indefinitely because uh, I know there's a few stoners in the crowd. Saturday night's a big night. In 1840, medical marijuana came to the United Kingdom by a William O'Shaughnessy, and reportedly he was used by Queen Victoria for menstrual cramps. We don't have any more. Huh? No, don't. You're gonna have to go. In, 18, in the 1840s, marijuana became mainstream. Jacques Joseph Moreau, in the, in the American Journal of Psychiatry wrote, in the 19th century, marijuana emerged as a mainstream medicine in the West. Studies in the 1840s by a French doctor by the name of Jacques Moreau found that marijuana suppressed headaches, increased appetites, and aided people to sleep. We're up to 1889. An article in The Lancet, a well-known professional, still to this day, medical publication, outlines the use of cannabis for opium withdrawal. Very interesting given the situation today with opioids. In 18... Did you get it back? No. Uh, we're done with the... Uh, we're done slide. with the PowerPoint. Okay. Sorry. Right. I'll, I'll move fast now. In 1900, cannabis was used for asthma, bronchitis, and loss of appetite in South Asia. It was one of the more important drugs in an Indian journal called the Materia Medica. In January 1915, President Wilson signed the Harrison Act, the model for future drug regulation legislation. I'm not going to read it all to you, but basically he was saying that medicine, okay, at this particular juncture people were not talking about psychoactive marijuana, they were talking about non-THC marijuana. In 19, from 1915 to 1927, 10 states passed marijuana prohibition laws. So you see the political tide was affecting marijuana as the country became more conservative in that stretch of time. And uh, people were a little bit anxious. Uh, the political tide shifted and even to this day, you know, there's still a lot of anti-governmental feeling about marijuana. We'll talk about that later. In 1918, U.S. pharmaceutical firms, firms grew 60,000 pounds of cannabis annually. In 1925, the League of Nations signed a multilateral treaty rest re restricting cannabis use to scientific and medical only. In 1930s, in the 1930s, American pharmaceutical firms started selling extracts of marijuana as medicine. In 1930, Harry Ansinger was appointed the commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. His case against marijuana rested on two assertions, that the drug caused insanity and that it pushed people toward horrendous acts of criminality. Still, a lot of people still think that way. In 1936, by the end of 1936, all 48 states had enacted laws to regulate marijuana. Its decline in medicine was hastened by the development of aspirin, morphine, and then other opium-derived drugs, all of which used, are used to replace marijuana in the treatment of pain. And to this day, in 1937, Again, the tide is still shifting is anti-marijuana. The American Medical Association opposes the proposed Marijuana Tax Act but supports research on medical cannabis. 
1938, the Marijuana Tax Act led to a decline in marijuana prescriptions. By the time the, the federal government passed the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937, every state had already acted, enacted laws criminalizing the possession and sale of marijuana. The federal law, which was structured in a fashion similar to the 1914 Harrison Act, <coughs> excuse me, maintained the right to use marijuana for medicinal purposes, but required physicians and pharmacists who prescribe or dispense marijuana to register with federal authorities and pay an annual tax or license fee. On October 2nd, 1937, the first marijuana seller was convicted under the U.S. federal statutes. In 1938, Canada prohibited cannabis cultivation. And interestingly, Canada is now in the process of nationalizing the use of cannabis. But we're still in that conservative political environment. In 1942, Marijuana was removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia, thus losing its remaining mantle of therapeutic legitimacy. In 1938, Fierro LaGuardia was the author of a report that concluded marijuana was less dangerous than commonly thought, a New York liberal. In 1968, the University of Mississippi became the official grower of marijuana for the federal government and still is to this day testing it every day, every week, every month. Nobody really knows what's going on down there. But Mississippi seems to be an unusual choice for that, obviously. In 1970, the Controlled Substances Act classified marijuana as a drug with no accepted medical use. The Controlled Substances Act, as part of the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, establishes a single system of control for both narcotics and psychotropic drugs for the first time in U.S. history. Pretty conservative now. We're getting close to where we are. That was 1989. In 1970, Normal was uh, incorporated. Normal is the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Uh, they put out a magazine. They are active in all 50 states. And just this week, PNC Bank closed their bank accounts without explanation. Just this week? This week. Hmm. Wednesday, I think it was. So something's up, but you know, I don't think you have to go very far to imagine what it is. It's Jeff Sessions in the Attorney General's office. In May of 1971, Nixon says he will not... Hi, Heather. Hey, Amy. You want to smoke? <laughs> what? <laughs> Nixon says in 1971, that he will not legalize marijuana despite the Schaefer Commission, which spoke to the contrary. Not a surprise on that either. Okay, in 1973, the DEA was established, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and the Office of Drug Abuse Law Enforcement were merged to form the DEA. Uh, Frontline, which is a public television program, called it Busted, America's War on Marijuana. We all know what the DEA does. In 1976, marijuana was decriminalized in the Netherlands. But interestingly, there was a show on public television recently that said that while marijuana was never legal to grow, in the uh, Netherlands, and as I'm sure you've all read about how uh, you could walk down downtown in uh, Amsterdam by a joint. You know, it was available. But the country has gone so much more towards the right that now it's more difficult to even do that, even if you're conforming to the law. It's a form of nationalism that we all know about. And I'm not making any political comments here about that. There's enough, there's enough daily in the news about what's going on in the world. Okay, in 78, New Mexico uh, passed the first state law recognizing medical 
And in 1980, Marinol, which is a synthetic Marinol, a synthetic version of Marinol, <coughs> was tested on cancer patients. And uh, Tim and I know a nurse who comes here occasionally, and she works in a long-term care facility, and they use Marinol quite a bit to help people with pain, with epilepsy, with MS, and on and on. In 1985, the U.S. government sold the Marinol patent to Unimed, and the FDA approved it also for nausea. And it is still being used, as I said, to this day. All right, I'm going to skip the next years. Incidentally, if anybody wants to see all of this text, if you, if you send me an email, I'll send you the link. I have it all, you know, in a file. It's a lot, but it's fabulous. How do we get to you? Uh, yeah, my personal email is Michael bu at aol.com and just put in the text in the line you know the subject line uh cannabis uh, paper okay and i'll send you the link i'm sorry did you get it okay in july 1991 53 percent of the oncologist survey say cannabis should be available by prescription in 1991, the first medical marijuana initiative was passed in San Francisco. As you all know, California was the first state in the country. And I passed around a map, I, I hope everybody got one, that shows where marijuana, uh, medicinal, and uh, recreational are available. If you don't have one, I think you know there's a few still left. Uh, <clears throat> California, um, last fall, actually, also legalized recreational. And Jerry Brown signed a bill a couple of weeks ago that combines both of those pieces, which is something that needs to be done. Governor Moonbeam, they call him out there. Okay, 13 patients in May of 1992 were enrolled in what the DEA called the Compassionate Use Program, and then it was terminated three months later. In July of 95, the second petition to reschedule marijuana, the DEA has a list of dangerous drugs. Schedule 1 and Schedule 2. And marijuana is on Schedule 1, along with all the other serious addictive drugs that are available by prescription. In 96, as I said, California was the first state to legalize medical. I'm going to move along here because I can see there's going to be questions and comments, I hope. Uh, in 99, July of 99, Marinol, the patented drug that I mentioned earlier, was moved to Schedule 3 to increase its availability to patients. Schedule 3 is, you know, fairly innocuous stuff. In 99, Maine legalized medical. In June, Hawaii, June of 2000, Hawaii and on and on. Right now there's 29 states that recognize medicinal marijuana and eight medicinal and recreational. For some reason, which I have not got an explanation, in 2003 the government got a patent for cannabinoids. cannabinoids. Uh, you can buy cab cannabinoids uh, online. Uh, I use a salve that comes from the hemp plant, and uh, who won the, you won the hat, yeah. You know, the leaves of the marijuana plant are where there's legal stuff that you can buy online. And I have a salve because I have a bad knee, and it actually has taken the pain away. I bought it online from some people out in California. You can buy it easily. It's not psychoactive. Very important point in the discussion about marijuana. There are two kinds. One gets you high, and the other one gets you well. Okay, so then Vermont in 2004, and on, and on, and on. 2006. In 2007, a DEA administrative judge recommended allowing new source of marijuana for research. And then, 
Here's a very interesting note. In 2008, there was a tomb of a guy named Yan Hai something or other, in which cannabis, two pounds of it, from 27 years ago was found. They found this guy's tomb. He was buried 2,700 years ago, and he had two pounds of uh, marijuana in his tomb with him. I guess they thought he was going to smoke it in heaven or wherever he was going. The Yanghai tombs near Turpan, China, have recently been excavated to reveal this this guy's grave. He was a Caucasoid shaman whose accoutrements included a large cache of cannabis. Uh, okay. In November of 2011, I'm jumping because I know I'm talking too long. No, you still got plenty of time. Well, I'm sure that there'll be questions, and I don't want to bore people by reading. You know, I'd rather, I can see that people are nodding. Uh, in November 2011, there was a study that showed that legal medical marijuana reduces fatal car accidents. States that, see, states that legalize medical marijuana seem to have fewer fatal car accidents, partly because people may be substituting marijuana for drinking alcohol. We don't know. Comparing traffic deaths over time in states with and without medical marijuana law changes the research and found that fatal car wrecks in, 19, in 2011 dropped by 9% in states that had it legalized. So if you want to talk about gateway, I'll listen. But if you want to talk about getting off of alcohol and using medicinal marijuana, we can still talk, because obviously that's my position. I've made it fairly clear. I wouldn't be in the business if it weren't. In, in 2014, and this is a really puzzling thing, there were new federal guidelines allowing banks to provide financial services to legal marijuana sellers. That's just contradictory to everything that's going on. Because marijuana is Schedule 1, number one, Schedule 1, people in the marijuana business have to operate in cash. They keep safes with armed guards 24 hours a day because they cannot get checking accounts or savings accounts or anything <coughs> from big banks that are federally regulated. And the same principle works with insurance, which is one of the things I'm working on. People in the cannabis business cannot buy appropriate insurance. And what's going to happen is that there's going to be a company operating, and somebody's going to buy some marijuana. I don't care whether it's medicinal or recreational. And there's going to be an accident. Or somebody's going to kill somebody. Some untoward thing. It's, it's inevitable. And these companies are operating without the protection of insurance, which would defend them if that was the situation. I spent decades in the insurance business. I've been retired for quite a while, but I'm back in it now. And I can tell you, people are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in businesses that don't have insurance protection when they get sued. So I don't think that Jeff Sessions is going to change that. Um, Okay, in 2014, <clears throat> the U.S. Justice Department said it would not enforce medical marijuana laws on Native American reservations. So the Indians are growing. Um, in 2014 as well, uh, there was a new law from the Justice Department from using funds against medical marijuana in states where it's legal. And actually, Trump had a um, bill, a funding bill passed about uh, a month ago, and they put no money in for the prosecution of people in the marijuana business. So, as I have said on many occasions, Trump has shown different uh, colors, you know, in his uh, position in marijuana. Okay, on June 19th, June 19th this year, 2017, Mexico legalized medical marijuana. President Enrique Peña Nieto signed a, three, a decree this week legalizing medical marijuana. I don't know what the cartels are going to do about that, but the measure also classified the psychoactive ingredient as therapeutic. That's fairly conflictual, but that's what happened. 
Okay. That brings you up to June. And I want to say a couple more things and then I'll take questions. There's enough data around, and I have an article someplace, it's not with me, that talks about medicinal marijuana. What are, what are some of the things? I've already mentioned some of the things that medicinal marijuana, okay, helps with MS, depression, anxiety, sleep. I think it can take, and there's evidence to show this, people off of opioids, and I don't have to tell this audience about what's going on with the opioid revolution. Doctors are taking people off of opioids and they don't know where to go. A lot of people go to the streets and buy cocaine or heroin or fentanyl and are dying. And the future of marijuana we see is this. There's two kids um, out in near Rockford. One of them, his last name is Kovler, K-O-V-L-E-R. He's the son of Jonathan Kovler. It's a very famous Chicago family foundation. You know, does all sorts of good work. So Kovler and another kid whose name is Ben, but I can't remember, are growing marijuana. They have three huge grows. Each one of them is like 10 acres each. So where did they get the money? Well, as it turns out, Ben Kovler's father and grandfather and great-grandfather were bootleggers and then, and then, started Jim B. So you see the same people who are in the alcohol business, and I think the pharmaceutical companies as well, are going to eventually move into the marijuana space. I don't know when, I don't know how. And one other thing, I, I, I believe that Correctly and properly regulated marijuana is good for states. And here's a number. Colorado is taking in, Colorado is both medicinal and recreational. Colorado is taking in $100 million a month in gross sales. And the state is getting 30%. So in a year, Colorado's state is getting $360 million to improve schools and roads and whatever. Something we could certainly use here. And I want to read one page of, and then I'm through, but I do have one last thing to do. Okay, so this is a white paper that I did for the business that I'm currently uh, operating. So some of this is repetitive. Uh, I titled this page, Some Observations About uh, Cannabis in the 20th Century. Cannabis is a politically charged subject that has millions of advocates and opponents. President Trump has in his left ear a guy named Peter Thiel, who was heavily invested in privateer. He was one of the founders of PayPal. He's a big time cannabis investor. In his right ear is Jeff Sessions, a longtime opponent. So Trump has, you know, I don't know what's in the middle, if there's a, you know, I mean, I think there's a brain, but I'm not sure whether the brain listens to the right or the left. But politically, it's, you know, it's more of a political thing. On the right, he has Sessions, and on the left, he has uh, Peter Thiel. Many of the nation's founders, as I've reported, have grown and profited from hemp. Uh, in Chinese culture, cannabis was medicinal, Persians, Henry VIII, Queen Victoria and past U.S. presidents like Bill Clinton have been users. When Lewis Powell retired from the Supreme Court, Ronald Reagan appointed a guy named Bork. I think his name was Robert or Steve. Robert Bork. Robert Bork. And when he was rejected, okay, and when he was rejected, Douglas Ginsburg was nominated, but he lost when a journalist named Nina Totenberg exposed Ginsburg's pot smoking behavior. Oh my God. Oh. Two presidential candidates, Al Gore and Bruce Babbitt, admitted to smoking. These very public events brought the discussion to the fore. <laughs> George Bush admitted to smoking. President Obama said he smoked a lot when he was a kid. Rand Paul, a doctor, 
was one of the first public officials to advocate for pot reform in line with his bill, the Compassionate Access to Search Expansion, blah, blah, blah. Bernie Sanders proposed legal policies on the subject. The point here is that cannabis is now a national public policy issue, although it is being left out to the states, which so far is okay. Other political candidates who were supporters were elected officials who included Stuart McKinney, I don't know who that is, Newt Gingrich, Judd Gregg, Olympia Snow, Tom Harkins, and Jeff Jeffers. With each new state electing either medicinal or recreational systems and processes, systems and processes have improved, but no two states are the same. Some have been modeling statues after alcohol, which I talked about earlier, and some like pharmaceuticals. Because of these subtle but important reforms and reformers, almost 200 million U.S. residents live in states with some medicinal and recreational program. 200 million. Again, illnesses like AIDS, chemo side effects, <clears throat> multiple sclerosis, anxiety, chronic pain, epilepsy, and many others are now eligible for some relief with that medicinal marijuana. The last thing is, the tax problem can be vexing for those in the business because Section 280E of the IRS Code says that a company trafficking its Schedule One product or Schedule Two substances cannot take deductions. The tax code does not demand that all businesses file returns, but those in the business are complying, are complying and are actually filing tax returns. Under a soft agreement, they are not being targeted unless there is tax fraud or evasion. So, there's also, besides the legality, there's a cash issue for the businesses, and they are not eligible for deductions from, and often, their taxes exceed 100% of the revenue. And the situation is being lobbied by the industry. Okay, so that brings me up to date. I have one last thing that I want to do. I have a present for Charlie, the second president of the night. Charlie. Come on up here, Charlie. Because I know I, I, I've anticipated your question. Because when I walked in, Charlie said, Oh, I already have my question, and I knew that. I do. I knew what that meant. <laughs> I already really have my question. I haven't heard the speech. I'm gonna have to come back. So Charlie gets another wee hat. To match, to match the one that he's not wearing tonight. He usually wears that floppy one. But this is, I thought, it's colorful. It's brand new. Bought it on Amazon. Oh, that's my hey. There you go. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. And, and a tassel for the king. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Charlie. Take this to you for that. Oh, all right. Thank you. Okay, guys. That's it. Hi. Okay. Do I get to pick the, do I get to pick the person to ask, who wants yes. to ask the question? Corinna. Uh, you talked about the history of um, the medicine um, in cannabis. Uh, how early did cannab was cannabis used for uh, industrial hemp? You know, in As this a country, textile. in this country, it was, you know, around the time of the revolution. Around what time did man discover that industri that, that cannabis can be used for textiles? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> no, I have no idea. I mean, it's not something that I you know, probably couldn't figure out. And I know your number, so I'll give you a call. Okay? Yes? If you go on Wikipedia, it'll tell you about George Washington, and he was encouraging everybody in the nation, even before he became president, to grow right. hemp because it, it was made for ropes, uh, it was great for making paper. It was, um, oh goodness, what was the other thing? Oh, and if you had swampland, it took care of that. So right. there's a, it, but if you go on Wikipedia, it'll show you all of that right. about Washington and his view of Everybody should give a little money to Wikipedia. It's a yeah, nonprofit organization. It is, it is. Just give them a couple of bucks once a year. You know, I give them a little bit every year just because it's terrific. David. Can you make a portable distilled spirit from him? Uh, can I make a what? A potable distilled spirit from half. I have no idea. Wouldn't be interested in it, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yes, sir. Here it comes. Take a shot. Do you believe in recreational marijuana? You know, I go back and forth on the subject. 
I think that recreational needs to be much more closely monitored, um, particularly when you think about gummies. Okay? I don't think kids 18 should be allowed to buy marijuana recreational. Uh, I'm actually ambivalent about 21. Um, I've been an occasional user of the cartel's marijuana my whole life. And I've never done anything crazy. And it was psychoactive stuff, you know, not medicinal. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but I do believe that the recreational laws should be much tougher. I mean, I would be even in favor of people being monitored, okay? In, in Colorado, you just have to be 21. You walk into a store and you buy whatever you want to buy. You can't smoke it outside. When they have conventions in Colorado, like they did a couple of weeks ago, a cannabis convention where most of the people want to smoke, they had buses outside the convention hall. So people would go to the meetings and then they'd go outside and smoke up in the buses. It's a controversial part of the issue. I am primarily interested in expanding the opportunities for medicinal because I think it really does help. Does it affect, does it affect the driving even if you're taking medicinal? Medicinal? No, because there's no THC. THC is the psychoactive element that makes you high, which I like, and I'm not embarrassed to admit it. But I also like the medicinal, which is not even the, the real stuff, to rub on my knee every night because it's better. So I'm in favor of medicinal without the psychoactive element, which is called THC, tetrahydrochloride, something or other. What is it? Tetrahydrocannabinol. Tetrahydrocannabinol. Yeah, I can't pronounce that. I, I can't. I can't pronounce it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question here from over the internet. A certain person who has attended here before, but is in Seattle, Washington tonight. Getting high, getting high, getting high, no doubt, because it's perfectly legal. <laughs> Who is it? I don't know. It's, I very well no Yeah, it's my son, Andrew. Oh! Uh, yeah. he, he says, uh, ask the speaker whether uh, he is aware, and I think you alluded to this, but maybe not in such detail, that Philip Morris, Bayer Monsanto, and the U.S. government own dozens of patents for cannabis uh, under subsidiary companies based in the U.K., Israel, and Canada. Yes. I mean, I didn't talk about it because, I, but I did mention that I think that the liquor, drinks companies, and the pharmaceutical companies are going to eventually swoop in and buy up all of these businesses and become distributors. It's just, it's, it's, you know, the handwriting is on the wall. We just got to get through the next three years. Yeah, and in the early days, companies like Park Davis and other major pharmaceutical companies not only sold cannabis. They sold, uh, I think they sold yeah, cocaine and various other things on the open market. Yeah, but not for long. Yeah. Yeah. Because you see, as I said, you know, the pendulum, the political pendulum has greatly affected the availability of any kind of marijuana legally. But now, with 29 states, I think that the pendulum has swung enough in that direction, as long as Jeff Sessions doesn't decide to close everybody down. The other bad thing that could happen is that the FDA could decide that it wants to regulate the growing of marijuana. And if that happens, like they do with drug companies, a lot of the little companies are going to go out of business because the FDA is tough. Tim? There's been a revolution in the microbrewing industry yeah. for years. Why is it going to take so long, even though we get these big companies, don't you think that the world's going to speed up enough that there'll be markets for it? Well, not as long in this country. I can't speak for other countries, but as long as it's a Schedule One drug. <laughs> Somebody got uh, everybody okay? Yeah, I mean, in this country, as long as long as marijuana is a Schedule One drug, the big companies aren't going to take aggressive steps. That'll change. You know, public opinion will change it, but it's not there yet. Yes, ma'am. It sounds like you've got the opinion that marijuana, recreational marijuana, is more dangerous than alcohol and tobacco. There's no studies that show that. But logic, I want to know what your logic would tell you. Well, logic would tell you that if you're high and you get into a car, you may get into an accident. But the truth of the matter is, and there are state police reports on this, the story goes like this. If a state trooper pulls a guy over going 90, he's drunk. If he pulls over a guy going 25, he's stoned. 
because everything is in slow motion. What about the diabetic that is that, that gets low on sugar or something like that? There are other things that will make the driver drive slow. Yes, of course. But and I don't know that the state troopers know exactly what to do. But the truth is that stoners generally don't speed. There's there's some evidence to show that in the California and Colorado. And trying to eat the steering wheel. Oh, nice. And Heather says they're trying to eat the steering wheel out of that as well. Yeah, God bless Heather. I'm going to wait for last for you, Charlie, because I know I, I, I know what's coming from you. Yes, sir. Okay. You mentioned hemp. Hemp? And I've been, yeah, I've been through three, a couple of flea markets in the past where guys are selling cloth ice cream, that sort of thing. But have there was, was there a time where they were interchangeable? Sure. I mean, what's the difference between hemp, which you still hear, and marijuana? Are they cousins in the plant family? Yes, or? yes. they come I from different it. parts of the plant. If you look at a marijuana plant, the leaves are the non-psychoactive stuff. In a mature marijuana plant, there's a bud that grows at the top, in the center. There isn't one on Charlie's hat, and I don't think there's one on this gentleman's head either. But at the top is the is the psychoactive part. That's the valuable part. And the rest is used industrially and as a, like I should, told you, on my knee. Is it the same plant? Yeah. It is exactly same the plant. same plant. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. Sure. Okay. Anybody else before Charlie? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to save something for the rebuttal. But well, I, why don't I would, you do that? I'm going to. So anyway, I'd like to ask you to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit about these corporations which uh, are really lobbying very, very heavily to keep marijuana illegal, right. both medicinal and recreational, you know, such as alcohol, pharmaceutical industry, and the prison industrial complex. They are pouring a lot of money into keeping marijuana illegal. Could you say something about that? Well, I can't say anything about the prison industrial complex. I mean, we all know that uh, the people making money with prisons are private prison companies. I don't know what the nature of that relationship would be. Well, but they give, they give money to politicians. Well, of course, they, they, have a, they have a lobby in Washington. But the largest lobbies right now in Washington, of course, are the pharmaceutical companies and the alcohol companies and the NRA well, yeah, and the insurance industry. Those are the four largest lobbyists who are taking care of our elected officials. And for now, they're just sort of laying in the woods or lying in the woods. They're not really chasing marijuana actively because it's a Schedule One drug. Nobody wants to get caught, okay, unless you're doing something legal. Well, if, you, if you're selling drugs or alcohol, you'd like to keep it illegal. Well, obviously. alcohol is regulated. Drugs are not, unless no, they're... I mean, it, it, it's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Charlie, you're up. Uh-oh. Uh Wait, there's one guy ahead of you, Charlie. Uh, all right. Yes, all right, sir. which one? Uh, what about other countries around the world? legalizing it or what have you got to say about that? Are there, are well, it depends on the country. You know, as I said, the Netherlands were very liberal for a long time and for some reason, you know, in the last five, seven years, they've become somewhat more conservative. Um, England and France, uh, which are, you know, major users, both legally and, and non-legally, are, you know, really supportive of medicinal. Most people including me, are on the fence when it comes to recreational. Okay? It's just the way it is. It's, we're in a transition period. You know, my theory, which for whatever it's worth, is that eventually it will be easy to buy both medicinal and recreational everywhere in the Western world. I can't speak about India. I can't speak about uh, South America, you know, or uh, other far distant places. I'm not working you know, in that space right now. I'm just working on what's going on here. Yeah, Tim. I need that I need you to help settle up an argument that we had in college. Which one you think is better, Sensimilia or Hawaiian? No comments. No comments. Did you have a question? Yes, I'd like you to speak more about your knee and how this uh paradox. Well, you know, I, I, I had two bad knees. 
and about a year and a half ago, I had the right one replaced with a total joint, and uh, I'm not happy with the way it went. It's stiff. I'm stronger. I mean, it's strong because it's a metal structure. So the left knee needed to be done as well, and I was afraid to do it. So I decided a couple of months ago to see if, you know, all the talk about topical cannabinoid oil works, and it does. The left knee, which was not fixed, hurts less than the right knee that was. That's my experience. So you rub it? I just rub it on. Yeah, I can tell you, if you send me an email, I'll tell you where you can get a jar for 100 bucks, eight ounces for 100 bucks. It actually comes from a group of women in uh, California who call themselves Sisters of the Valley, and they dress up in habits. And they're a .org, which means they're a nonprofit. But they're not nuns. <laughs> Sisters of the Valley. It's easy to find. If you just Google Sisters of the Valley, you'll find it. Yeah. Okay, Charlie, you're up. All right. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's another question oh, from let another Charlie man. Talk. <laughs> let Charlie talk. Let Charlie talk. Just to the, quick. Can you say something about various studies, medical studies, the effects of, you know, the bad effects of marijuana use? brain development and teens and this, you got anything? There has never anything? been a death reported from marijuana, ever. You can look at all of the literature from the early 18th century on in this country. I don't know about other countries, but there's never been a death. There are no lawsuits about people dying from an overdose of marijuana. What about the potheads? Yeah. Well, are you a pothead? No, I don't take that stuff. Well, you should try it. It might make you happier. Yeah, try it. I tried it. Make me psychotic. It made you psychotic. We're driving like this. Well, because you were taking the one with the THC. So try some that's medicinal, and you won't have any complaints when you get out of bed in the morning. Can you see a marijuana lobby like the liquor? There is a lobby. Yeah, there is a lobby. Normal. I mean, a really powerful one that will will. I think that right now there are there are lobbies in every state because it's a state regulated product, okay? Once every state in the union legalizes medicinal, which I think will happen in the next five, eight years, there'll be a lobby in Washington. But the lobby is not to get it legal because the states are smart. They need that money, that tax money that I talked about. But they need to get it off of Schedule 1. That's what's holding back the whole effort, the whole positive effort of medicinal marijuana. If they get it off of Schedule 1 onto 2 or even better 3, every state will have it all. And you won't need any more federal regulation. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm just thinking that lobbyists are on guard for any Threats yes, to yes, industry. there are lobbyists in Washington already, you know, but they work mostly for the, because the, the, the marijuana lobby is not rich, okay? It's, it's a weak lobby, and it's mostly being done by states. In the future. I don't know. I, I, you know, I can't predict the future. There's lots of money flowing. I do, I do. We could use the state of Illinois, which has twice as many people as Colorado, could use that 300 billion times two <laughs> to fund schools and roads and things, okay? I mean, it's not going to happen with Bruce Rounder, although Illinois did legalize medicinal, but there are only, uh, Illinois, I think there's only about 12 licenses so far in Illinois. California has the most, Colorado, and Michigan, interestingly, has 220,000 medicinal users. Very big state in Michigan. Very, very popular in Michigan. Is there any reason for that, the difference? Why are a lot of people in this focus? Okay. It's been available for a while. You know, it's just a time thing. It's just time. Charlie, you ready? I got several, but I'll... Oh, all right. All right. If you come across any studies, Michael, uh, about how many work days are lost when you legalize marijuana. And no, I've never I've never seen any data to that effect. Yeah, and what about smoking dope at work? Is that allowed? Or? No, no, no. And I certainly wouldn't condone it. And uh, the truth of the matter, though, is that uh, if you go for a job, you know, you get tested. And employers have the right to randomly test people. I mean, I don't know what it is state by state, but I know people in this room 
who were looking for work and wouldn't get high because they were going to get tested when they got an interview. So I, I just don't have any evidence that it changes how you work. I'm sure it does. But not the TH, but not the, 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 the medicinal. The stuff that gets you high is what gets you in trouble at work. Is that it? Well, one last one. I happened to be in Denver the week they legalized marijuana. Yeah. And I happened to notice that the place that opened up, they just put a sign on a storefront pharmacy. <laughs> but it happened to be in a bad part of town. Yeah. Now, do you think that the people, there are more sick people in that part of town? or Just more they available. Choose that location? I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, what's, what's happening now is that doctors, you know, are stopping the, you know, free will you know, unadulterated distribution of opioids, okay? It's everywhere. You see it on television, in the newspapers. And in states where marijuana is recreational and or medicinal, but particularly medicinal is legal, I believe that people could use medicinal to replace opioids. You know, I believe it has some of the same qualities. But as you say, a lot of those people are poor. And you know, to get a medicinal card, you gotta pay up front a couple hundred bucks to see some doctor, and then you gotta pay a couple hundred bucks for an application, and then you gotta pay 400 bucks for a little tiny bag. I mean, it's, it's an expensive habit. But I think that there's enough research that shows that it can and will, in the long run, eliminate the need for people being on opioids or street drugs that produce the same result. Okay, anybody else? Let's give our speaker a big hand. Okay. Yeah. 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 Can everybody learn something? That's all. That's all. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the first rebutter. You're gonna be the first rebutter? Yeah. My friend Tim is gonna be the first rebutter. Are we taking your hand? Oh, we'll take a show of hands in a minute. Hey, for you, boy. Very good. Good, uh, could we have a show of hands tonight to see who, uh, raise your hands if you want to give a rebuttal or say a few words about this. I'm going to get a head count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, was it? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, 12 people. The triangle will try start with four minutes apiece. Let's see how it goes. Okay, uh, come on up. Uh, Tim is first. You know, one of the things I'm going to be very one about. One full at a time. I uh, Thank hey, you for smoke right down back there. Marijuana. I haven't done it in a few years, but I think what finally got me to quit smoking was when I went into the Navy and they had a no tolerance drug box. The problem is I took up smoking after you know, because it's a sort of a substitute, and I'm now a nicotine addict. I will say this though: when I've been high, or supposedly inebriated and relaxed, it can be one of the greatest feelings that you can get to kind of calm down. The other thing though is, if you're trying to do something or do some kind of work, it can be the most frustrating place to be. Whatever you do, if you're smoking a joint, never install windows on a computer. <laughs> I tried it once. It how, about was, how about tonight? I think tonight may have been a little bit more, but that was more Microsoft's fault. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, right. Maybe I could have used some tonight to get yeah. it calm me down right. and put me in a decent state. Okay. But... No samples. Uh, I wish... I almost, I almost wish I had some. Well, stop by sometime. <laughs> <laughs> the big thing for me, though, is that uh, addiction and a lot of the uh, stuff that goes with it 
can, you know, I, let's just put it this way. I've had my trouble with alcohol. I've had my trouble with um, sometimes even the cannabis over the years. I generally don't do them now because I figure it's a waste of time, but it takes a long time to get off this stuff. Drugs in particular, I have to warn you about, you know, they may be legal in some way, it may be there, but we better, if we're going to treat it, we better treat it like alcohol, regulate it, tax it, and make sure we have the appropriate laws in place to take care of any problems that may arise. Right now, for example, I know that if I go out drinking, there's a little bar about four blocks from home called Cavern on the Bridge. And if I'm a little bit inebriated, I know I can walk home. I also know, too, that if I'm out at a place and I want a beer, no more than two, because if I'm going to drive, that's about all that will be taken up for the legal limit. If I want to indulge in cannabis or something else like that, but it be illegal in the state of Illinois, I just don't touch it. But now, if I take a trip to California or some other place where it is legal, I might indulge. The point of the matter is, is that our world is changing fast. Look at how quick the institution of gay marriage came in. It was less than four years. Our world is speeding up. So this cannabis legalization can definitely be happened within the next five to seven years. And the other thing you also have to realize, too, is that our technology and just basically the whole world's this way. So what would take decades before will probably just take less than a few years. I mean, you know, just as soon as you get a hold of a computer and learn how to use it, they change it on you. It might be the same. It's sort of the same thing with our laws. In summary, <coughs> I am an advocate of legalization and responsible use. That's the key, is responsible use. I say people have the right to be stupid, <coughs> but not stupid enough to take another's life. Thank you. Yes, You ready to go out and smoke a joint? Not now. <laughs> All right. Uh, is, this what, is, wanna... is this what people were looking at while I was talking? That's because that, that's because I, could, I had to find an appropriate Sorry. background. It's all right. We're rude. We had an appropriate background for you because you're going to pull up your uh, PowerPoint. So, okay. All right, listen, I want to thank you very much for the presentation. I want to make a, what do we have, four minutes? Is that it? Um, Andy's the boss. That's okay. A uh, couple of topics. One thing I want to say about uh, drug usage. I've worked for five years at a substance abuse agency out on the southeast side of the city. And one of the things that we would always talk about were the effects of the different drugs and kind of what an amazingly dangerous drug the alcohol was relative to something like marijuana or even you could argue uh, heroin because when somebody's under heroin or an opioid drug they're not going to commit any kind of violence when somebody is under marijuana it is very, very unlikely that any kind of violence or other kinds of stupid behavior is going to occur. But when people drink alcohol, violence happens all the time all over the city, and the nature of alcohol is such that it inhibits anxiety and shame guilt but it unleashes the other emotions, including anger. And when this violence goes down, you know, somebody gets shot outside of a club or in a club or there's fights all over the place, alcohol fueled, you never see the alcohol really discussed. They talk about the guns, etc., or the gangs. Alcohol, at one point, this was back in the 90s, you. 50% approximately of the people who were incarcerated for violence 
non-instrumental violence, did so under alcohol. And so when it comes to the usage of marijuana, the alcohol industry, which by the way lobbies so that you can drive your car and have <coughs> literally uh, the equivalent of uh, four shots of hard liquor in your bloodstream at the same time, uh, and it's okay to go out and drive a car. And a lot of people do not have a tolerance for that kind of drinking. And since alcohol disinhibits, people maybe start out, I'm only going to have one or two, but before you know it, they have six or seven. So we have laws where people can drive a car in very, very bad shape as far as their reflexes and their judgment go. And, I, and it's just very important to understand that if marijuana, recreational marijuana, I mean obviously medical marijuana is no problem, but recreational marijuana, if it's legalized, will probably eat into the profits of the alcohol industry. And by and, and just to uh, finish up with it, you know, with the opioid crisis, which has essentially been initiated by the pharmaceutical industry and the doctors who benefit from it, very addictive. But again, when somebody is under the influence of heroin or opioid drugs, no violence, no problems at all, because that drug always uh, inhibits anger. And, and it's just very important to recognize that and for people uh, to be aware. I don't know if I, do I have any more time? Yeah, you got, what do I got? About a minute. Okay, a minute. All right, I'm going to just go to another topic really quickly. I want to give you a weather report, which I've done here numerous times. Uh, from the start of the Industrial Revolution in 1750 up until March 2015, the average global temperature has gone up 0.85 centigrade. Right now today as we sit here, it's at about 1.5 or 1.6. That's a very, very rapid doubling. Not very much time. And it's important to note that once it gets above 3 degrees centigrade, life is never really going to be the same. If it gets up between 4 and 6, somewhere between those numbers, uh, there will not be anything really left. It's very important that people start to assimilate what's really going on and to, it's going to take great socio-political pressure to get the people who are in power on all sorts of different levels to try to do whatever they can to cool this planet down before it's too late. And that includes taking the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Thank you. All right, Hey, John. Listen, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the opioid, I've got a little speech problem. The opioid epidemic, a lot of that was uh, doctor prescribed. <clears throat> now, I've got these facts from the National Institute on, on Drug Abuse, and it's evidence-based research. Uh, basically, I agree that medicine is okay, medicinal uh, marijuana is okay, but um, an, an, ingredient, an ingredient in, in in marijuana is T THC, which interferes with, with memory, especially verbal memory. Heavy use of heavy use among young people cause IQ to go down. It affects their schoolwork and their work if they're working. Mar marijuana causes a range of, of, of emotions. It can cause psychosis. I took the marijuana 20 years ago. I was psychotic. I was scared. I was I was driving my car and I, and I saw hills on North Avenue. Where the, North Avenue doesn't have hills. <laughs> and uh, I stopped. Thirty years ago, that was okay. Uh, uh, it causes psychosis, hallucinations, anxiety, fear, panic, loss of identity. I had all that for that little. I just tried it. Okay. Uh, Marijuana adversely affects driving. It affects judgment, motor coordination, reaction time. I called 311 to check this out. It's illegal to drive with mar uh, marijuana in, uh, 
uh, incapacitated like that. That's illegal. Marijuana has a potential to promote cancer of the lungs and other parts of the respiratory tract. Mar marijuana has 70% more irritants and carcinogenic ingredients than tobacco. No, no, no. no. It's gummy. This, this is all from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Yeah. You don't believe I'll give you the phone number, okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, Time's up. Wait a second. Ma ma marijuana can cause amotivational syndrome or marijuana use disorder. Yeah. It appears in 30% of teens. It makes them lazy. They make them potheads. Yes. yes. Marijuana use before the age of 18 you're four, four to eight times more likely to be dependent on marijuana for your future years. I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, school work, school work, social relations adversely affected by marijuana. Attention, memory, and learning are affected, negatively affected. There is reduced intellectual function. Students have poor academic outcomes. This is a fact. Marijuana causes addiction and dependency. 30% of teens are affected to some degree. There is a risk of heart attack the first hour after smoking marijuana. The risk is four times the usual risk. And uh, Tim was saying something that once you get on it, it is hard to get off. The average person has been on it for 10 years, and they've tried six or eight times, tried it, and they can't get off. They're addicted. Yeah. And I think but happy. it's destroying the moral fiber of the United States, just like they're bringing all these refugees in. Yeah. 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 Destroying the moral fiber. Hey, you had your shot. I went. No, Sorry. No. You went. Wow. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> you told it like can, I, uh, can I have the rest of that joint you're smoking? Yeah. 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 I jump, I jump. All right, Jonathan. Go, no, Jonathan. Thank All right. you to our speaker for a great talk on an important subject. Uh, there's a lot of people in jail right now for nonviolent uh, possession of marijuana. And I hope one thing we all can agree on in America is they should all be immediately released and provided with reparations for their non-crime that they had due time. I'm thinking about our brothers and sisters tonight who are in jail and yet Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld still aren't. Uh, this is from Hunter S. Thompson, one of the most famous uh, recreational and medicinal marijuana users in the history of the world. I think. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we're all wired into a survival trip now. No more of the speed that fueled the 60s. That was the fatal flaw in Tim Leary's trip. He crashed around America selling consciousness expansion without ever giving a thought to the grim meat hook realities that were lying in wait for all those people who took him seriously. All those eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. But their loss and failure is ours too. What Timothy Leary took down with him was the central illusion of a whole lifestyle that he helped create. A generation of permanent disabled and failed seekers who never understood the essential old mystic fallacy of the acid culture. The desperate assumption that somebody, or at least some force, is tending the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, when I think about uh, Hunter, I think about somebody who probably at the end of his life wished uh, that he hadn't taken so many drugs and, and found, instead found something to replace that with. Maybe being out with nature, volunteering with nonprofit organizations or grassroots civics groups, and, and being involved in local music chapters, art, dance, poetry, adult education classes, or free speech forums like the College of Complexes. Um, I don't think the government has any right to tell anyone whether they want to use recreational drugs or not as long as they're not behind the wheel of their motor vehicle. Um, so, you know, it's, it's everybody's right to exercise that. I'm just thankful that I have found other ways other than that uh, to feel closer to the higher energy of the universe, whatever you want to call it. For medicinal use, it is very important. 
for us to all be behind this, especially for the disability community, veteran community, senior community, and retiree community. Um, I've seen it in my own family uh, when you uh, use ingredients uh, in muffins or cookies or uh, bread or cake or pie. Uh, it does make a disability that otherwise is very painful and very exhausting and very stressful uh, not as an overwhelming thing. Uh, this is something by Henry David Thoreau. I don't think he drank alcohol or smoked, but uh, he, got, he got a high in his own way off being with nature. So this is a quote. If the day and the night are such that you greet them with joy and life emits a fragrance like flowers and sweet scented herbs, is more elastic, more starry, more immortal, that is your success. All nature is your congratulations, and you have cause momentarily to bless yourself. The greatest gains and values are farthest from being appreciated. We easily come to doubt if they exist. We soon forget them. They are the highest reality. Perhaps the facts most astounding and most real are never communicated by human to human. The true harvest of my daily life is somewhat as intangible and indescribable as the tints of morning or evening. It's a little stardust caught, a segment of the rainbow which I have clutched. Thank you, Speaker. All right. All right. All right. Thank you again to our speaker. Or, or maybe will you will you share your PowerPoint? Let me on. If you send me an email, I'll send you the All right. link. Yeah. Great. That that's great. Yeah. Um, one little point. Somebody there was discussion about Trump on uh, on marijuana. Trump has said that he favors medical marijuana, uh, and he thinks that the recreational issue should be state by state. Jeff Sessions is the guy that. Uh, anti-marijuana and as long as Trump uh, keeps the reins on him now if Pence becomes president that could change so that that could be a worry it's true more more than Trump um, I guess uh, I certainly believe in the need for medical marijuana I know too many people personally who have benefited from it and our speaker of course is, is one of them and I know many other people it should be legalized it should probably be legalized nationally as quickly as possible, although uh, it's probably going to go state by state. I think we should also uh, rec or legalize recreational. I mean, if alcohol is going to be legal, smoking and various other uh, addictive practices and substances, uh, uh, marijuana is probably the least harmful to society and the individuals uh, uh, as any of those. But the, the, the thing we really need to do, in my opinion, is to end this, this ridiculous, expensive, uh, and resource drawing and useless war on drugs that we're still in the middle of uh, since Nixon uh, and before. It's costing billions and billions of dollars. If anything, it is having the opposite effect. We've, we've had many speakers here and elsewhere that have, have pointed this out. But it's very, very difficult politically because the estimates I heard that there are approximately a million jobs or perhaps more than a million jobs in this country that are in part or in whole uh, dependent on the war on drugs. If the war on drugs ends, a lot of these jobs go away and that is that is the, the difficult part of it politically more than uh, anything else. So we have to continue to, uh, to fight on that to get rid of the, the war on drugs, to take all these drugs especially marijuana because it's the least harmful, but some of the others too, control and regulate and tax them. And we would all be better off uh, if we did that. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make on this is uh, uh, the economy. I am told, of course, this uh, whole cannabis thing is going to be a huge, huge industry. I mean, it already is the black market. The black market is. Uh, the black market of marijuana is not as harmful as the black market of liquor was during Prohibition, but it's still a black market. And if it were legalized, there would be there would be at least some oversight, and there would be some tax dollars uh, to benefit uh, uh, other other things, schools, who knows, health and care, etc. Um, but it, it's going to be a huge industry. Uh, I am told. And uh, I, I don't have verification of this, that Colorado now has the lowest unemployment of any state in the country. <laughs> and because huge numbers of people are moving in, 
and well, and it's stimulating the economy, and and it is in itself a new economy. So we should take uh, some note of that. Everybody should take note of the tax dollars, stimulating and, worker productivity. but the economy in general. There's, it's just a huge uh, stimulation to the economy. One of the problems is. Up until now, uh, I favor entrepreneurs and small business people, and that's who has been uh, taking care of uh, uh, marijuana up until now. I think uh, once it's uh, more legal, it will go, and I think our speaker alluded to this too, it's going to go to corporations are positioning themselves already with patents and, and various other things scale. to control the industry. So, okay, thank you. All right. Four minutes. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Edgar, and I've got some information that I'm going to pass out to all of you. Speak right um, into the mic. I think I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is that better? Better. Okay. Um, I personally have never tried marijuana. I'm not, and I don't drink. I don't smoke. But that's okay, you know, and I have no objection to people doing that. When we talk about the bad side effects of marijuana, it sounds like we're talking about the bad side effects of what we're eating, of alcohol abuse, of drug, other prescription drug abuse that you were talking about. It doesn't sound like it's any different. To me, it seems that there's a lot to be said for moderation. Now, about 20, 30 years ago, I don't know if you know about Bill Moyer, but he did a, uh, it was a 12, uh, that there was a series of 12 episodes, and it was about uh, drugs and how they affected the brain. And I can just tell you a personal story. When my son was going to, my youngest son was going to Gordon Technical High School at the time, I see it's brushed by the ball. Um, he and his friends were a bunch of smart asses, came to school with the papers and the paraphernalia. Didn't have any drugs, thank God. But we all got called in, and he and the other boys had to go to uh, Catholic charities and there was, I, think a, I don't know how many weeks that they had to attend, and the parents had to attend too. And I'll never forget the first night that we were there, they had all these drugs down, you know, I mean things, tobacco, alcohol, heroin, marijuana, all these things, you know, what is the most dangerous one? So we put all these things down, we all said heroin. They said, no it isn't, it's tobacco. Tobacco is the most addictive of all of the drugs that are out there. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is um, the, uh, what, what is what is going on in Illinois right now. And this is what I'm going to be passing out to you. You do with it what you want, okay? But Illinois Sen uh, Senators Heather Staines and Illinois uh, State Representative Kelly Cassidy have introduced identical legislation uh, to the General Assembly to legalize recreational marijuana for adults in the state. It has the bill numbers in here, so if you want to write letters to your legislators supporting it or saying it's a bad idea, that's up to you. Okay. And they, what they're saying is that they want this legal, they, they want this uh, pro, the marijuana products to be um, to be monitored with the tax as uh, we do alcohol and tobacco. That anybody that is uh, only the people that are over 21 can get it. The bill also calls for marijuana to be regulated like alcohol and tobacco. Okay. You have to show proof of age and all of that. Did anybody see the uh, series that, it, that was on PBS and it was about prohibition? Yes. Okay, do you remember yes. what the guy said? Tell me what you want. Step around the corner and I'll get it for you. And before we had the repeal of prohibition, there was no law regulating it, none. You didn't know what you were getting, and that's the same thing that is happening with uh, recreational marijuana. You don't know what you're getting. If it is regulated, we will know what, we're, what is being used out there. Now, when somebody comes to work drunk, I don't know that they're going to be any better off or more productive than somebody that is stoned. That's, you know, that's up for debate. Uh, but I will pass this each of, to the tables around you, and thank you for letting me have my say. Thank you. I, um, all right. I don't really have a strong opinion on the topic of marijuana legalization. What? You can't? Okay. I don't really have a strong opinion on the topic of marijuana legalization. I mean, um, it's like 199 on my priority list. I, I do think it does seem to me that the country is kind of headed in the direction of legalization now. 
But um, I do kind of think that having the tough drug laws actually is the best of both worlds because it means that those who want tough drug laws have got them, and in the meantime, those who want to get high can do so. So, um, but you know, a gentleman who was here earlier, he left, and I wish he'd stayed. He was, he was talking about how drugs are destroying the moral fiber of, 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 the, of our country, like refugees. And I, I, I wish he was still here, because then I could ask him whether he feels that, the, that, that refugees like the Pilgrims and the Puritans in the 17th century destroyed the moral fiber of America. I think there's a strong argument to be made that they did. That they, there's, by the way, I'm a descendant of, of those guys. And, yeah, I'm a poor Quaker. That, that's right, that's right. Well, that's, and, and not to mention what they did to the Indians, which brings me to my joke, which is, what did one Indian say to the other when they saw Columbus landing? Anybody know the answer? There goes the neighborhood. Bingo! Okay. the answer? There goes the neighborhood. All right. Okay. I've got some miscellaneous notes here. Top. Too much wishful thinking, not enough critical thinking. Uh, somebody was passing some, something out at the beginning of the evening from some supposed demolitions expert who says that he's used explosive demolition taking down buildings as tall as 80 floors. <laughs> That's twice the height of the tallest building ever taken down with explosive demolition. The guy really sounds like he was stoned. <laughs> the list of dates is not really very informative. Marijuana has been used to get high as long as we have any, any records. Um, the, the concrete archaeologic goes back a few thousand years. There's no reason to think it's that recent. Um, however, claiming that, it, that, that all kinds of religious stuff really was people who were stoned out of their gourd is made up. Um, you get all kinds of, of um, ideas that people have and start pushing with really nothing underneath them. Uh, no, Moses' burning bush was not a pot field. Um, and the hemp fiber, which is, has been a staple for a very, very long time, is from a not just a different part of the plant, but a different variety of the plant from the intoxicant. When Columbus sailed, he was sailing ships whose sails were woven out of hemp fiber. When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he was writing a paper made out of hemp fiber. During World War II, it was patriotic for farmers to grow lots of hemp for the war effort. Um, and certain parts of the middle of the country still have people scrounging some of the, some of the, the leftovers that have gone feral. Um, and just a list of dates leaves out some of the most important dimensions. Drug laws in the United States have always had, well, not, they're not all completely racial, but at a minimum they've had heavily, heavily racial components. Opium, Chinese, uh, well, which way did it go? Cocaine, blacks, alcohol prohibition, the Northwest European wasps, noblesse oblige, saving, the dark Catholic South and West Euro or East Europeans from themselves, and of course, um, you know, marijuana is is uh, uh, was a, a twofer for Nixon, both hippies and blacks. Uh, the the prison industrial complex is a major blight in several different ways. Um, decriminalization was was the favorite buzzword for quite a while. But a couple of years ago, some of the people who were hardest on this uh, started using the word regulation. Tobacco is regulated. There are laws about who can buy it, who can sell it, and so forth. And alcohol is, is, is regulated. Again, who can buy it, where it can be sold. Certain things are forbidden when you've been drinking, such as driving, and um, somebody said, well, what if somebody's stoned at work? Well, heck, what if they're drunk at work? That's right. um, it, what's, you know, it, 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 it's, 
not like it couldn't be a problem, but it's not like there's no answer to the question. We already have all kinds of customs, mores, regulations, laws. There is no sane reason for marijuana to be illegal. Where's your hand? My hand? Oh, my hand. Here, right. You can't talk without your hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The war on drugs is still going on. Yeah, people are being arrested every day. Lots of people in prison that wouldn't be there otherwise. And uh, speak into the mic. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yes, but legal or not, it's going to continue to be used, and uh, as it has been all my life, anyway. Uh, the cannabis medical, med medicinal or recreational, whichever we want to talk about, they're essentially the same thing. There, there is no way to get around that. I mean, this is it's the same plant and it's, it's what people are buying. I mean, I have some experience with that. Uh, in, in Arizona, where I've been living for several years recently, uh, the cost is about $150 for a medical opinion and a recommendation, another $150 for the state. So they take in about $300 a year from every patient and give you a card allowing you to buy it for, for that year, basically. Uh, what else here? Uh, one of the problems law enforcement is having uh, with this is that it's very hard to detect. They can give you a blood test or a urine test, but, uh, and they know if it's in your system, but they don't know if you're impaired. This is where the problem comes in, because they want to arrest people for being impaired, but they can't establish that. Uh, it, it's been very helpful for people transitioning from um, alcohol or opioids. Uh, I've got some experience with alcohol and with cannabis, and uh, they're quite different, no problem there. <laughs> I mean, the alcohol will kill you, and, um, and uh, that's enough said, I guess. But anyway, uh, prices are coming down with uh, legalization. And from what I've heard in Arizona recently, they were selling for about $100 an ounce at the uh, lowest end. <coughs> cheap these days. Another one. And uh, where else here? I was recently, the last couple of years, I was talking to a couple of friends, and we talked about the fact that between the two, three of us, we had about 150 years of experience with this stuff. And uh, no ill effects yet, but uh, but anyway, uh, and I'd like to make a comment about someone mentioned earlier about causing problems with lungs from smoking. It. But uh, actually, there are those who say that it has been helpful to people with lung problems, and uh, it's causing you know improvement basically. But anyway, and you need both the THC and the cannabinoids in the plant for it to work medically, uh, for it to have a positive effect on pain and many other things. It's used primarily for pain, and that includes things like arthritis, and, you know, whatever. But, um, but either way, uh, it's here to stay, and we can legalize it and make some money on the taxes for brand control, like we've been trying to do for a long time. And that's it. Thank you. Ah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, the uh, Don's joke put me in, in mind of a joke that Will Rogers told one day when he was speaking after dinner to an audience in Boston. Stuffy matron asked him, Mr. Rogers, did your ancestors come over on the Mayflower? Well, Will Rogers was a, some of you may remember, was a partner of Cherokee descent. He was from Oklahoma. No, ma'am, but they met the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of sorry that George, the conservative who spoke to you earlier, isn't here. Uh, he never stays for the rebuttals. Until um, he gives one. Until he gives one, correct, Mike. But he, he, blamed, he shelled out all these statistics about how bad marijuana is for you. Well, no one ever said that it wasn't. 
the soda alcohol and tobacco, and he pointed out that it causes lung cancer. Well, so does, so does tobacco. My mother died of that, and she was a smoker from the 1940s when she went off to college until 1989 when she quit cold turkey. And that probably bought her another 13 years that she was able to spend with us. Um, and I'm also, <coughs> you could also get those statistics, you could also get statistics about how bad alcohol is for you, although I'm not saying that people shouldn't drink by any means. But you could probably get them from the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And I mention them because I lived in Evanston at the end of the 60s and through most of the 70s, including when, the, when they were still powerful up there. And when the big ruckus started, when they when the Holiday Inn opened in Evanston, and they said they weren't going to open with, until they, unless they got a liquor license so they could serve liquor with meals. And that started a whole hoo-ha until the Evanston City Council finally passed the ordinance to give the Holiday Inn the license that they desired. Uh, finally, I am minded of a humor, reminded of a humorist named David Fry, who was popular about 40-some years ago. He did an album called I Am the President and Make No Mistake About It. And in, the, in one of the skits on that album, Richard Nixon, played by Fry, of course, is encouraged by one of his aides to try a joint before he drafts his drug bill. And at one point you hear him say, this is heavy grass. And also, I see colors. I see terrible, a little depressing brown. I see Pat Brown. He's winning. He's going to be the governor of California. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm I'm Lo Champiel and I started coming to the college about 60 years ago, when Slim was still alive. Uh, what, is, what is the name of the gentleman who mentioned uh, the drug wars as being motivated by racism? That was Neil. Neil, yeah. He's not here, huh? Yeah. Well, he made a good point, and I think in addition to that, Harry Anslinger, converted the country from using the term cannabis to the term marijuana so it would be considered a Mexican drug. And it was his way of attacking not only marijuana but the Mexicans. In any case, the received wisdom is that you get further away from reality the higher you get on any drug whatsoever. And that you, get, you can get closer to reality without a drug. And that would be, that might be true in a civilization that was not living on a, on a completely false basis. And the falsity of the basis of this civilization was demonstrated again today in the Chicago News, an odd little newspaper um, that reported that coastal cities like New York and New Orleans would be pretty well flooded within 15 to 20 years. Uh, that's only the least of it. Uh, but the builders go on building in those cities. People go on living there. We, uh, our wisest uh, investor, Warren Buffett, said, about a year ago, that the threat of global warming is greater than the threat of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We, in response to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the German declaration of war a couple of days later, uh, the country wound up spending or committing, by the end of 1942, what would be the equivalent in 2017 dollars of 17, of the seven and a half trillion dollars. That was after. Uh, the Republicans and the Southern Democrats were saying the oh. national debt is too large and we couldn't spend any more money on New Deal, on New Deal legislation anyhow. So this country is living in unreality. I got in touch with reality about the third time I smoked marijuana. It was too much for me. 
I faced something within myself that scared the hell out of me. Fortunately, I, I was in a group. We were doing a nude in. That's part of what encouraged me to get, finally get high. And I was with a group of people that I said they would be called hippies who gave me very good support. And I got through that evening. And in the decades since, I figured out what the hell it was that scared me within myself. And that's what is preventing everybody from facing reality. It's not uh, drugs or alcohol. It's our fear of what the reality means. And I have been courageous enough in the last few days to face the suffering that comes from the realization that um, Stephen Hawking's is probably correct in predicting that the temperature of the uh, planet Earth will go to 250 degrees, which means the boiling away of all the oceans and the water. But don't fear, there will still be rain. The only problem is it will be sulfuric acid. <laughs> I've been suffering with this and figuring out what to do about it. It's not that I can control um, carbon emissions myself, but maybe I can do some kind of activism to get uh, uh, more get get more people aware of the, of the murder that is being plotted of their great grandchildren. This is reality. This is re reality, and what happens when people get high can be used to contribute to that. But this this country is the greatest addict in history. It is addicted to consumption and production, consumption and production, profit margins, profit margins, profit margins, devil takes the hindmost. This is the most deadly addiction in, in the history of any species, and it's what is leading us to the destruction I just described. And uh, maybe I should run for office saying that <laughs> the federal government should fund uh, grass for everybody so that uh, our, our demise will be eased. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
I might add that she was uh, a deputy state's attorney out in Los Angeles. And I was with her once when she made a buy. Also present was a deputy sheriff who came along just to make sure that everything went okay. Um, the truth of the matter is, we've not yet learned as a society how to handle drugs that can be either good or evil. Liquor has many good uses. I mean, aside from its recreational uses, it does have medicinal uses. And yet, a hundred years ago, uh, we were having fierce debates here in Chicago and across the nation as to whether demon rum should be made illegal. And it was, and as a result of that, uh, we had a land office business in illegal, uh, in illegal alcohol. Same thing is going to happen here. I personally am on the fence at the moment regarding uh, marijuana. For this reason, I would like to see more of a study made on, I mean, we know it's going to get you high. We know you sometimes do stupid things when you get high. That's not the point. I'd like to hear more about the long-term effects of marijuana. Not that we, so we can ban it, but so we at least know what the pitfalls are and how it can be dealt with. Same thing is true of alcohol. Many of us, most of us here, like to take a drink now and then, and sometimes right now. However, uh, there are people who have been ruined by it because they've taken too much. This doesn't mean that we ban alcohol, nor should this mean that we ban marijuana. It should mean that there should be a judicious approach. And frankly, as corny as this sounds, it begins with the family. In many families, alcohol has been both a blessing and a curse. And in wiser families, they've taken the kids aside at an appropriate age and say, you know, this stuff is good, but not in the hands of some people. Make sure you are not one of those people that has that problem. If you do, find something else to uh, occupy your attention. Uh, it's worked successfully in many families that are wise enough to do that kind of thing. Just as I think their smart families are going to eventually take their kids aside and say, look, I know you smoke pot. Make sure you do it judiciously. Make sure you don't let it run you. Uh, my, is my time up? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good, good, good. Good, good. All right. I'll be click. Thank thing. you. Let's thank our speaker again. She gave us nice handouts. PowerPoint. Uh, I think the idea of giving me a gift to ensure a nice rebuttal is a good idea. <laughs> it's a custom that should be maintained. Anyhow, thanks a lot. It was good. Can you let me know when you got another one. I'll uh, jump around very quickly. Um, I was tutoring a young uh, student and she was experiencing headaches. And I said, what, what precipitated that? But she confessed to me that she had been smoking marijuana every day for, I think, several years, and uh, she had stopped using it. Yeah. I didn't realize that somebody, Pat, I think, mentioned prolonged usage. Um, certainly, uh, another little story is, um, uh, you know, in my place, we, we got more into alcohol, and the uh, drinking shots at Burghoff's downtown and sort of for gold, gave up on marijuana. That's kind of an ag college type activity. But um, I have a friend um, who has a bit of a drinking problem and he got one of these medical certificates um, <laughs> that he could get the marijuana. But in his case, and I'm, this is anecdotal, uh, it was not a good combination because he's, from what I understand, he's turned into an absolute jerk that people can't deal with. You know, one of those obnoxious alcoholics. You know, I mean, they were like that downtown. But, you know, uh, I'm glad you didn't make what I call the guilt trip uh, arguments for marijuana. Uh, certainly, someone in pain, uh, we don't want to, we want to see that alleviated. Uh, I 
I'm often even curious that uh, that going back to the use of herbs is a, a modern modern medicine, but I, and if it works and alleviates the pain, I guess there's no reason not to do it. But um, the the other thing is uh, arguing for uh, uh, legalization of drugs is particularly difficult and bad timing right now with an opiate epidemic. Apparently, whether or not that's genuine or not, uh, you know, uh, that's not good. It's maybe not good timing. You're gonna have to cool it on your uh, lobbying efforts until that one's taken care of. Because it's the, the, the real hurdle in legalizing drugs are the suburban mothers. Uh, if we can get them to agree to it, because this is the great fear, is that Johnny is gonna start using dope, you know, and, uh, go bad or something like that, you know. And I must agree, he's left here, George, George and I agreed totally tonight. He was over here earlier. Yeah, you, you, we don't need any more Manton families taking <laughs> over. <laughs> and he was right on the money then. But anyhow, um, yeah, and, and Jonathan had on it. It's a victimless crime. One last thing about the thing about your 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 guy, the deathbed confession. I did catch that too. The guy uh, used demolition on an 80-story building. Well, he was just talking, you know. Now, I worked on the 40th floor downtown, and I looked down on most of the buildings in the loop. And to say that he used demolition on an 80-story building, and that he's maybe just hyperbole or bragging, but that's like Don Hancock Tower or something like that. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Let me get got another one in it. Drive home safely, don't get stolen on the way home. By the way, when I was 21, my girlfriend, we had a, she gave me a birthday party. They had a cake with 21 joints in it. Good recruitment tool. I just got a couple of quick comments. Yeah. Uh, we'll wrap up here in just a minute. Don't know which way. Jimmy, you guys okay over there? We weren't closed yet, if you didn't know. Um, you can have it. Uh, you know, the program will be over in about 10 minutes. The speaker will get the last word here. Is, uh, can you hear me in the back there? Is that thing not, not very well. Speak into this. And use your platform voice. Hello? That's better? Yeah, yeah much. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier tonight, we saw, uh, if you were paying close attention uh, as we watched the rebuttals, you see, week after week, year after year, the College of Complexes host people in the free speech forum part. And you see, people are very much in touch with certain segments of reality and agree on that. And on other things, they're totally out of touch with reality. Uh, was it Moe that said, uh, you know, people are living in uh, fantasy land on certain kinds of things? Um, the media maintains us in a bubble of ignorance. Um, as far as uh, my views on medical marijuana or marijuana in general, uh, in this country, uh, they teach young people are taught the, the wages of sin are pregnancy and death, <laughs> basically. And so you can't teach in schools, you can't teach how to have a life uh, free of pregnancy and still enjoy companionship. The wages of sin are pregnancy and death. And marijuana falls into the category of other kinds of things that would ease people's pain for a reasonable price. And if you, uh, this book here, as I mentioned earlier, Democracy and Change, it talks about the Koch brothers using a strategy, and it's found uh, really spelled out with what the pharmaceutical industry is doing. You charge whatever the market will bear. If somebody doesn't have enough uh, money to pay for a medicine for a child, let the child die. Just thinning the herd out. Uh, if, as a nation, if we don't 
join with a lot of other protesters and move forward and do something about the billionaire predator criminals that are running our government right now, uh, the United States is going to continue to slide downhill past the point where one person mentioned once we get past the tipping point in global warming, then it's going to be an irreversible cycle. And uh, an article was published this last week about uh, a couple of hundred coastal cities around the world that will be under 10 to 20 feet of water by 2050, 2060. This is not something that's two or three hundred years away. And the military, the U.S. military, is absolutely correct in saying that the threat of global warming and climate change is equal, the greatest threat to our country, way beyond uh, terrorism or anything else. So all these battles, uh, political uh, infighting we see, uh, you know, should we make marijuana legal or illegal? Uh, should we have for-profit prisons? You know, the elephant in the room on all of these things is who profits, who wins, and who loses. And until we address that issue of billionaires saying, I have, you know, a billionaire can say, I have uh, 10 billion in the bank, but I'm not secure yet because I got to put two kids through college. Uh, this is not uh, greed we're looking at. This is sociopathic, psychopathic, mental illness. And some of these psychopaths have raised the top and a, hand, a list of people hand-picked out of this group of billionaire swamp dwellers. They are running our country right now, all through the, the top issues. And incidentally, for those of you that still think we have a president, that's an illusion. The United States does not have a president. The United States has a corporate criminal con man masquerading as imitating the president after he was installed. Right? So uh, the first thing you start with is um, Common Dreams is one of the best websites for uh, regular uh, news that can be, uh, what do you call it, peer-reviewed uh, science. <laughs> Uh, not, not somebody, not uh, opinion like what you get out of Rush Limbaugh or Glenn Beck, but uh, scientific uh, research that's been done all over the world, uh, the best of the best every day by authors that have published books their whole lives. What was the name of, of that stuff. website? The website is called Common Dreams. It's commondreams.org. Common the second, my, my second favorite is one called The Smirking Chimp. And that's after The Smirking Chimp was George Bush. And the third one is Truth Out. Truthout.org has massive archives of up-to-date environmental issues coming in from other countries talking about global warming, pollution, all kinds of stuff. Those three sites will give you a, a, a tremendous leg up on what's happening in the world every day. You know, you can't learn this stuff by watching the 6 and 10 o'clock news. It's not there. It's junk food news we get now. So anyway, if anybody wants any more information, uh, come see me at the back. I'm our good. speaker gets the last word, no, so give our speaker a hand and come uh, up. Our speaker the people, says he's good for the night. The people, so the people I wanted to talk to left. We will uh, we will call it adjournment then, and uh, everybody just relax amongst yourselves for uh, two or three, four minutes as we're cleaning up the tables, and uh, we're adjourned for tonight, and we'll see you next week. Is that understandable? What I said. And the fellow Neil with black hair.